Hello and welcome to Motorweek. On this week's programme, we have our first UK drive of the new Mini 1. To catch the last of the sunshine, we look at Volvo's luxury convertible, the C70, and Richard Hammond says farewell to his long-term test car, the RAV4. You know, I am so excited today because at last I'm getting to drive the new Mini 1. Richard went swanning off on the launch, but I'm sure it's more my kind of car than his. Look, I've even made a special effort with what I'm wearing. Retro headscarf, sunglasses, I've even got the Mini skirt on. Well, nearly. But if you haven't seen the new Mini 1 before, be prepared for a shock because the Mini ain't that mini anymore. So it's goodbye to the swinging 60s and hello to the noughties. I guess when you think about it, BMW's input into the all new mini was going to radically change things. And even though the original mini was a classic, it needed to be completely overhauled to stand a chance of competing in today's tough marketplace. With a price for this Mini 1 an extremely competitive £10,300, they're off to a good start. Now this is totally different to bouncing along in my Auntie Lane's noisy old Mini. It's very refined, but it still seems to have managed to hold on to some of that quirkiness of the old Mini. So maybe I don't feel as daft dressed like this after all. Now with the modest 90 brake horsepower, the Mini 1 will take you from 0 to 60 in 10.5 seconds. And with a top speed of 115 miles an hour, you ain't going anywhere very fast. But then this is a Mini, it's not a TVR. But the real joy of this car comes with the handling. BMW employed consultants costing them millions of pounds. And over the course of a year, they came up with a very pleasant surprise for all those hard-nosed car journalists who haven't got a good word to say about anything. I mean, they just can't fault it. And believe me, that takes some doing. Even on the faster, more uneven surfaces, the Mini holds its poise and stability superbly. The steering is responsive as you'd find in any sports car. And this gearbox is a really nice short throw and it's dead notchy, simple to use. In fact, every aspect of this Mini's drive is brilliant. It's as simple as that. It might be worth noting that for an extra 50 quid, you can get a steering column mounted rev counter to get those gear changes just right. Now, I used to have to shout to get myself heard in my Auntie Lane's old Mini, but the road noise has really been deadened in this new Mini 1, so I can you quite normally. Now, it's Mini by name, but definitely not by nature. There's enough room in here to throw a party. But this means some of the boot space has had to be sacrificed. It's quite small back there. With the old Mini, people, my mum included when I wanted to get one, used to worry that you wouldn't stand much of a chance in an accident. Well, no need to worry with this new Mini because it's bursting with safety gadgets. Driver, passenger and side airbags, anti-lock brakes, you know, this car will really look after you. And so to the interior styling. Now I like that even more than I like the handling. It's the attention to detail in here that's impressive. Very retro, yet totally classy. Right from the window and light switches to the door pulls and speedo. And thankfully, no BMW badges to be seen. Now there's an extensive range of options available when it comes to styling which you can get separately or as one of the packages called rather sweetly salt, pepper or chilli. See Richard, I told you it was a girly car. Now I loved and wanted to own an original Mini myself and I thought I'd be driving something quite similar today. But I just can't believe how much the Mini has grown up and changed in every aspect. I don't know what the opposition are going to make of this. I mean, it's so reasonably priced. It looks fantastic and really stylish, and it drives like a dream. No wonder BMW are already snowed under with orders. I quite fancy one myself.
It's 12 months since I took delivery of this long-term test Toyota RAV4, and now it's gonna go back today. I just can't believe it. 12 months since I first drove it. Seems like only yesterday. Ah, the old 4 by 2 Still work at a building industry. I'll fix that with a bit of 4 by 2 love. Well, there is some 4 by 2 in this picture. Can you tell where? Yeah, it's not any of this, it's the car, because it's the new Toyota RAV4, and for the first time there is a two-wheel drive version. Toyota tell us it's not then a 4 by 4 it's a 4 by 2 <laughs> Toyota claim to have invented the SUV concept with the original RAV4 six years ago. And who's to argue? It was the first soft roader, light, nimble and fast on the road and about as much use off-road as an oven glove to a card shop. This then moves the whole sector on, because now we want our soft roaders, well, a bit more like our proper off-roaders, apparently. Toyota reckoned that we want a more mature car, a bigger, butcher, bolder car. And that explains why this one is bigger, butcher and bolder. Oh, come on, out! Isn't it just amazing, the stuff you accumulate in a car over a year? Good Lord! I wonder where that had gone. Excellent. Mind you, we have covered a few miles together over the year. I've been living with this Toyota RAV4 now for, what, three months, and it's racked up ooh, just over 9,000 miles, so we've got to know one another pretty well. Very well, in fact, because during that time I've become a father and we've moved house. So we've been through a lot together already. Come on, out of the way. Good grief! I didn't even know I had most of this stuff. Whoa! OK. OK, now just keep going. I'm coming in. I'm coming in to get you. Just keep going. Oh. Ah. Oh. Oh, I've missed you. Mine, the Rav and I have had our rough times together. It hasn't all been plain sailing. There you go, little fella. Off you go. I was reversing out of a supermarket car park and this bollard, it just leapt and, well, I hit it. Thing is, there was a massive noise. So I jumped out of the car expecting to see the whole of the thing crumpled up at the front like a student's visa card bill. But in fact, all I got was this. Just some scuffing. This plastic moulding in the bumper had protected the whole of the car. So all I'm going to do is get the thing sprayed in at its first service, and Toyota need never know. Apart from the fact I've just put it on the telly. Oops. Whew. Well, that's about it, I reckon. Nearly there. I'm just going to get Charles out, and then I'm going to take the RAV out for a last and final drive. There you go, big fella. Hey, don't worry. I'll find you somewhere else to live. relationship with the RAV has proven to be a real learning experience because when we first got together a year ago, I've got to say, well it really wasn't my type because I love extravagant cars, cars that are in some way too much, too big, too expensive, cost too much to run, just over the top and this clearly isn't and that's its charm because as we all know there's a big difference between driving a Ferrari for a day and living with a car for a year. Then it's the boring things that suddenly start to matter, things like comfort, practicality, and I've really enjoyed it. Something else that has made a huge difference to my life, and I can't believe I'm sitting here telling you this, is the higher driving position. I've no idea why there's probably a scientific reason for it, but on longer journeys sitting that bit higher somehow means it's not such a drag. Don't know why, but I've enjoyed it. In fact, we've travelled 23,000 miles together in our time, and my only complaint throughout that year has been fuel consumption. My little friend has something of a drink problem, seldom returning much above 25 miles to the gallon. Mind you, the payoff for that is sparkling performance for an off-roader. There is another part to this story, and it's very good news if you bought one of these or you're thinking of buying one. When it became time for this to go back, I rang Toyota and said, yeah, the car costs what? Nearly 20,000 is new. Can I make you an offer to buy it second hand now, a year later? They said, yes, if you give us 18 and a half thousand pounds. I 
can't believe it. That's fantastic news, not for me trying to buy it now, but for you if you've bought one or you're thinking of buying one. To lose just one, one and a half thousand pounds in over a year on a new car is brilliant. Right then, this is it. The end of the road, the parting of the ways. Take it, take him away, go on, remove him. Goodbye, old friend. It's been a wonderful 12 months. We've had a lot of adventures together. I've got to go. The history of Volvo cars, briefly explained, using food, a silly wig, and a dodgy Scandinavian accent. <coughs> Many years ago, the Volvo cars all used to be square, like the block of cheese. See? No curves at all. Then the Volvo people realized to keep selling the cars, they needed to become more curvy. Like the potato, see? Lots of curves. Happy with the new image? What could possibly be next? Yes, a sexy, convertible. So there we have it. The old Volvo, the new Volvo, and the sexy Volvo. It's easy, isn't it? But is the Volvo C70 convertible a spicy pepper? Or is it a bit of a dodgy spud? Now you might not know it, but performance isn't such a strange word to Volvo. Years ago they successfully rallied the old 240s. They've had a cracking history in the British Touring Car Championships and of course they are the chosen motorway stormers of our police force. So powering the C70 we get a fairly spicy 5 cylinder turbocharged engine and that produces just under 200 brake horsepower. But it's enough to get you to 60 in a little over 8 seconds. Just the thing when you need to rush home to watch your favourite Swedish movies. Whereas the majority of today's convertibles are smaller two-seaters or two-plus-twos, the C70 is huge and easily seats four adults. And that's because it's based on the same platform as the V70 Estate, a shape we're more used to seeing from Volvo. Now when it comes to going topless, some cars are better than others, but the C70, well it's not one of the better ones. On a straight road or fairly subtle corners, it's not too bad, it's actually quite nice to drive. But if you start to hurry it and really push it through faster, sharper bends, you're going to scare yourself. There's absolutely loads of body roll and more flex than you'd get in a yoga instructor. And the suspension, well for me, it's set up far too much with comfort in mind, especially when you've got nearly 200 horsepower under your right foot. Another disconcerting fact about the Volvo's cornering habits is that every time we hit a bump on a bend, however small, the traction control light came on. Hmm. I'd shudder to think what happens in the 240 brake horsepower C70. I bet the dashboard lights up like Blackpool Pier. Now if you're going to buy the C70 convertible as a backlane stormer, you're going to be disappointed. But if you want to cruise in comfort and style with your family and friends, you're going to be on a winner. These seats are as comfortable as any sofa, both front and rear, and they wouldn't look out of place on a Bentley. And don't forget, you can fit four adults in this car, no problem. And the interior, whilst it's not the last word in style, it is fairly well laid out and you do get quite a good spread of equipment. You've got heated seats, separate driver and passenger heater controls, the usual electric windows and mirrors, trip computer and a fairly decent stereo system. Now maybe half decent stereo isn't strictly fair, as our car is fitted with the optional 10 speaker Dolby surround system. Though the unit itself may look a little old fashioned, the sound is unbelievable, especially with the roof up. Now with the exterior styling, Volvo have got it spot on. The car looks very sleek and stylish, yet it remains instantly recognisable as a Volvo. Oh, and that roof is great for those who hate pulling levers, locking catches and fiddling in the boot. You just press a button and the car does the rest. Prices for the C70 convertible start at 25 grand for the 2 litre and go up to 32 grand for the most powerful T5. Our car, with all its extras, comes in at 32 grand and for me, it's the one to go for as any more power would be less than relaxing and the stereo and the super smooth auto box make for really enjoyable driving. Now with this class of car, the masses are always going to go for the likes of the BMW 330 convertible or a Mercedes CLK. But if you want to drive something that's got style and class and is genuinely different, then this is your motor. 
And as for it being a dodgy spud or a spicy pepper, well, on the bendy bits, it is a spud, most definitely. But in all other areas, fiery pepper. Well, that's it for part one, but after the break, Ian Royal has a used car tip for us with the Vauxhall Calibra, and we have a behind the scenes look at the Benetton Formula One team. I look back fondly to my very first car, which was a gold Capri. This was in the days before I had any taste, of course, but at the time, everyone wanted a Capri. It was the 1980s, and then Ford ditched it. But these days, if you want a three-door sensible coupe, what do you go for? Something at reasonable money? Well, how about a Calibra? OK, I know it's a Cavalier underneath, which doesn't say a great deal for it, but I think this is one decent car that still looks good and doesn't cost a fortune. Plus, there are plenty about to choose from. So, first things first, check out the car's history. Has it been serviced regularly? Then start the engine up, give it a bit of a rev and see if there's any nasty blue smoke coming out from the back of the exhaust. That can be particularly relevant if you intend to buy a turbo model of one of these. Now the Calibra is quite a big car, it's got a very decent sized boot on it, and not only that, it also seats four people in reasonable comfort. Plenty of space inside the cabin, including lots of headroom for the rear seat passengers. Now this Calibra is well over six years old now. This is an M-Reg 1994. It's done 88,000 miles, but it's still in very good condition. And this is one of the nicer spec cars, which I would recommend that you go for and look out for. This has got the leather seats, it's got the white dials, it's got power steering, it's got heated seats, it's got the alloys, it's got the sunroof too. And when this was new, it would have cost about 18,000 pounds, which is not particularly cheap. Even now, with this sort of mileage on, this would still sell for somewhere about four to four and a half thousand pounds. Cars like this are a bit of a throwback to the 70s and the 80s when coupes were all the rage. And the coupes really sort of took over from the hot hatches like the Golf GTIs. Main rivals for the Calibra would be, well, probably the Ford Probe, which didn't last very long, or the VW Corrado, which did. But at least these things are cheap to service and to run, if not particularly cheap to insure. Just make sure, as we've already said, to get the car checked out, make sure it's got a good service history. Remember, many of these cars have probably been thrashed and trashed over the years, and you don't want to end up with a bad one. The Calibra certainly still looks the part on the road. Production started in 1990 and ran through until 1998. So cars will be on H plate through to R reg. Just get them checked through well by an expert. Calibras are front wheel drive and although a Cavalier underneath, do handle and drive better and they need to do. Now when you think about it, this car was thought of and conceived some 12 or 13 years ago. So you might think it's getting a bit long in the tooth now and doesn't handle well. Well, it does. It tends to slightly understeer when you push it hard into a corner, but this is one decent car to drive, and at this sort of money, I think it's a bit of a good buy. So, could I recommend a Calibra? Yes, definitely. It's an all-round capable car. It's still good to look at. It's good to drive. It's economical and not too expensive to buy. Plus, it'll impress your mates. That's this week's one careful owner tip, the Vauxhall Calibra. In their heyday, Benetton were the team to beat, with Michael Schumacher giving them the championship in 1994. Recently, however, things have changed. Before the start of the season, Benetton ruled themselves out of competition and were hoping to score points only. Even having the ever youthful Jensen Button hasn't helped them through the troublesome period. It's been a tough year, definitely. Um, I knew it would be tough, so it's, it hasn't been too bad. Um, a lot of it's been just, just getting new parts on the car and just seeing what happens really. It's, 
more working towards next year than this year. Button's teammate Giancarlo Fisicalla joined the team in 1998, hoping that they could assist them in achieving the driver's title, but his aspirations have had to be put on hold. Well, so we are working very hard to improve our problem, which is uh, not just reliability, but especially performance of the engine and of, of the car. But we are very confident for the for the end of the season, especially for next year. The team were aware of the fact that this season would bring difficulties, despite having Renault power. Although both drivers are more than capable, Button has found it difficult to adjust. Yeah, it, it is. It is difficult changing teams, um, especially coming to a team that are very good, but they haven't got the you know we haven't got the best engine or the best car on the on the grid. It makes it very very difficult when you're inexperienced to work with that. Despite recent performances, the team have been continuing with their extensive testing programme and have enlisted the help of Formula 3000 driver Mark Webber. Benetton this year have a total of six points, all of which came from the German Grand Prix, where Fisichella and Button finished fourth and fifth respectively. Fisichella will not take comfort from the fact that the team have already found his replacement in the form of Jarno Trulli. So, for a team that's so used to winning ways, this season so far has proven to be character building. On next week's Motor Week, Richard Hammond has our very first drive of the all-new Audi A4 Avant. We'll see you next week.